part of being a writer is going out and doing the research. For the Civil War book, I had a historian teach me how to shoot an 1841 Springfield musket because that's what a lot of the Confederate troops were using. And so I, I did a lot of research because I think this hands-on sort of research is what it takes to make a book real. And there are some writers, I think, who read movies to, to do research. I, I honestly suspect Stephen King of running dead men walking before he read The Green Mile. But I didn't. I went to Riverbend and sat in a chair. I want to know what it really feels like. So I probably ought to talk a little bit about the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Because there are a lot of guys here, and they tend to hold on to that thing they were taught in the fifth grade, which is that fiction means it's all made up, and nonfiction means every word of it is true. Okay, you need to let that go. So the time you get out of junior high school, that's got to go. Because it isn't true. It's really almost more of a style or whether or not you trust the person who's writing the book. Have you looked in the nonfiction section of a bookstore lately? Getting in touch with your pet guardian angel? Is it nonfiction? The <laughs> 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 astrology of plants? Nonfiction? <laughs> and even worse, my cop by Adolf Hitler. Non-fiction. <laughs> this is your idea of true. <laughs> and well, I'll give you a personal example of this. There was when you become a writer, you tend to meet a lot of celebrities. I know people from the House of Lords, country singers, NASCAR stars, movie stars, and they look at writers the way the rest of us look at hairdressers, doctors, and plumbers, which is to say, do I need one right now? And as soon as I hear somebody really saying this, they go, write my life. Because that's all they think about is themselves. You know, Ooh, write my life. <laughs> and so there was a time when I sort of tried to write the life of a famous celebrity and didn't get very far because he has the attention span of a popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> but the quote can't be fun. I forgot more than you'll ever know about him. And so. I really did know all about his life, and I, I was going to write his little biography, but he wanted it so sanitized that it would have read like Old Yeller without the dog. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say anything bad in my official biography, so we're going to leave out his parents' divorce, the times he got thrown out of school, when he messed with drugs, the split of arrest he got as a teenager, all his shenanigans, you know, we'll leave all this out and we're going to have this, this perfect little, it would be like the life of the Buddha, except that it would have happened in the United States in the 20th century. And that would have been in nonfiction, his official biography. Now, what I could have done, because there was a lot of really good stuff in his life, what I could have done with it is change the names, change some of the details, and publish it as a novel. Then I could have used all the juicy stuff about his father's old girlfriend and him getting thrown out of school and all that stuff. Change the names, call it a novel, and it's going to be in the fiction section. But which one is true? The sanitized nonfiction version? Sometimes the only way to tell the truth is to call it a novel because otherwise they will sue you from here <laughs> so long. <laughs> <laughs> so, with my books, that's often not a problem, except when it comes to doing research. And doing research is a key thing to anybody who's doing historical novels. You have to be able to trust your information. And amateur researchers, I have discovered, simply go around and ask the oldest people they know what happened, <laughs> which might work if you don't go back too far. But in the case of Valda Crane Silver, who was the first woman hanged for murder, she was hanged in 1833. So if in 1995 you're going around asking old ladies what happened, you're 100 years too late to find the right ones. They don't remember 1833 in 1995. So um, one 
this is this is an example of kind of how I work. The guy who did the nonfiction account of the Frankie Silver story, as I said, asked all the old ladies how she was hanged, and every one of them had seen cowboy movies, and so they said, oh, they built a platform, and they had a trap door. She stood on the trap door, and they told the labor, you seen that, right? That's all the cowboy movies. But I didn't believe it. So I looked at other hangings. Frankie was an 18-year-old girl in the mountains of North Carolina. She lived in a log cabin. Used to killing her husband, tried in Morganton, and sentenced to die in July of 1833. So what I did, and there were there were no written accounts. So the first thing you look for is did somebody attend and write a letter or a journal or something saying here's how they did it. There weren't any. So then you have to use common sense. So I looked at three hangings. I looked at the hanging of Matt Turner, who was the head of the Slave Rebellion in the, 18, in the 1830s in Virginia. And I looked at um, the hanging of Tom Dula, Statesville, North Carolina, 30 miles away from where Frankie was hanged. He was hanged in 1868. And then I looked at the hanging of John Brown, which was in Charlestown, what was then Virginia in 1859. So, Matt Turner, the only place to, to mount a rebellion and kill people in the United States. They knew they were going to hang Matt Turner before they caught him. They were sure of it. He killed like 16 people. <laughs> when they did catch him, we have written records of how it was done. If you want to read the fiction account of it, William Styron won the Pulitzer Prize for the confessions of Matt Turner. And he's very exact about how it was done. They took Matt Turner to an orchard, they put him on a ladder. They tried to rope around the branch of a tree and they took the ladder away. That was 1832. So we know that even though they were positive they were going to hang him and they had weeks to prepare, they didn't bother to build a platform and a trap door, they just used a ladder. Then I came to Tom Dilla in 1868. They knew they were going to hang him. He'd had two trials, he'd been found guilty, they had weeks to prepare. This was in a little town called Statesville. North Carolina, about 50 miles north of Charlotte, um, 77. And um, the New York Herald sent a reporter down to cover that execution. So he wrote it up and described it in great detail. And we have the New York Herald's account of the hanging. And he said they put Tom New on a cart. They took him to a field next to the railroad station where they had erected a tea post a post with a cross piece going over it. They put the rope around the cross piece, they stood him on the wagon, they let him have his last words, they led the horse away, the cart went out from under him, and he brought. In 1868, 30 years later than Frankie Silver, and 30 miles away from where she was hanged. And with Frankie, they knew they, they weren't sure they were going to hang her. She was 18. Half the jury had written to the governor asking him to please pardon her. And there was a lot of sentiment in her favor, and there was every chance that the governor would relent because she was a young girl. And they kept waiting, you know, for the writer to come over, they'd off the raw and wait for the piece of paper and saying, okay, you can let her go. And it didn't happen. The sheriff, I talked to his great grandson, said that. The man had tears rolling down his cheeks the whole time he had to do this. He had daughters her age. And what he did was he waited until the very last minute, thinking, in a minute now, that guy's going to come and I won't have to do this. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, when nobody showed up with a piece of paper, he put a rope in a cart, took it up to the top of Damon's Hill on Morganton, stood her on the cart, put the rope over a tree branch, and led the horse away, just like Tom Dillon. The one case I found before 1880 in which someone was hanged using the trap door and the platform, well, two cases. One was John Brown in 1859, and the other was the Lincoln conspirators in Washington in 1865. In both those cases, they used very elaborate built platforms with trap door. Both those executions were carried out by the United States Army. 
with the United States Army Corps of Engineers handling the preparations. If you have that much tax money to work with, and that many expert engineers building your facilities, then yes, you can have the most elaborate party you want. But if you're talking about a one-term county sheriff, which is what they had in North Carolina, and you serve four years and you're out, and he's got a little county budget, and he's not sure he's going to have a person anyway, he's not going to build a trap door, and I don't think he had the expertise to do it if he wanted to. So that's how I do research, common sense. Asking old ladies what they remember 160 years later is not in my opinion reliable. <laughs> so after I finished writing this story about that 18-year-old girl hanged for murder, the reason I read it was not because it was a trial, and I really didn't much care who'd done it or anything, but what it was was that she was an 18-year-old girl from the frontier part of North Carolina, those mountains. The people that settled the mountains were all those who did not work and play well with others in Britain. The Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, and the Cornishmen. <laughs> now, if you go, if you go east of I-77 in North Carolina, you'll get to the eastern seaboard, the flat part of the state. That was settled by the English and the French much earlier on. In the 1600s, the eastern seaboard was settled, mostly by the French and the English. And then the Scots and the Irish came later after the Bonnie Prince Charlie business in Scotland and after the recession in Ireland. If you want to understand the flatland part of the South, so I would say everything west of Oak Ridge in Tennessee, everything east of I-77 in North Carolina, everything east of Roanoke in Virginia, south of Atlanta, no, north of Atlanta, everything south of Atlanta, flatland south. Um, you can rent John McGuinn's, Steel Magnolia's, Roots, the Yaya Sisterhood if you must. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to understand the mountains from Oak Ridge to Morganton, the movie to rent is Braveheart. The story of the Scots and William Wallace, because the Baptists settled those mountains. The Scots and the Irish, and that movie documents a clash of cultures between the flatland English and the Irish and the Scots, who were the Celtic people. And that clash of cultures continues in many ways to this day. And so I like to document that. And Frankie Silver was a really good example of what happens when those cultures meet head on. Here was a Scots Irish girl from a log cabin in the mountains accused of murdering her husband and dismembering the body. And so when they arrested her and took her down the mountain to Morganton, she was in the other culture, the flatland culture, the one with all the rules, like thou shalt not wear white shoes after Labor Day. <laughs> and one of the first questions I ask is, who were your people? So they didn't understand each other. They thought that she was a savage and was capable of anything that she was accused of. She didn't trust them. They were the wine and cheese people. And so she wouldn't talk to her lawyer and she wouldn't tell them what really happened. The reason that case was important, she was an 18-year-old girl and that's a tragedy. She died, a child was orphaned, a little tragedy. One family is affected. So that story was a warning culturally that said two halves of the state of North Carolina do not understand each other, and if they don't fix it, it's going to blow up in their faces. And they did. 32, 30, 28 years later, the Civil War. When the Civil War came and North Carolina seceded, the Flatland South was heavily Confederate. Oh yes, they had the plantations, they had the slaves, they had all these reasons for seceding from the Union. They didn't like the tariffs because they actually bought stuff from overseas. And the people in the mountains didn't have slaves, had a subsistence economy, were a little more worried about crops and the hardships of the frontier than they were about politics. And so they were largely in favor of the Union. And because of that, you had 
massacres in America, the Stonewall Massacre was when Confederate troops executed 14 men from a mountain community. And I wrote about that in Ghost Riders. So I followed this business of the culture splitting and where they, where they come into um, <laughs> opposition. But a lot of people read the Bell of Frank's story and only got the hanging part. They missed that whole sociological context, which is why it's it's taught in the sociology at the University of Colorado in Hispanic studies. It's taught it in England because they had the same split of cultures. But like I said, a lot of people said, oh, okay, you're doing North Carolina hangings. Who can you do next? Tom Billy. Well, I knew enough about the Tom Billy case because I read a lot of history. My, my motto is chance favors the prepared mind, which was said by Louis Pasteur talking about microbiology, but it also works if you're studying history or English. Chance does favor the prepared mind. The more you know, the more connections you can make. So everybody said, oh, you got to do Tom Dooley, and I had read the story, and I knew that if anybody read the story of Tom Dooley, it ought to be Jerry Springer. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go near it. It has poverty and ignorance and illiteracy and adultery and venereal disease. And I just really thought, look, I spent my whole career celebrating the heritage and culture of the Appalachian Mountains. These guys could bring it down in the years. <laughs> but uh, one thing stuck in my mind that I knew from having written Ghost Riders, that one of the narrators of Ghost Riders was Zebulon Van who was a mountain boy from Asheville, North Carolina. And by the time he was 30 years old, he was governor of North Carolina. By the age of 30, this mountain boy who grew up in a log cabin had been congressman, senator, colonel of the 26th North Carolina, and governor. So definitely a high achiever. After the war, let's stay with him for a second. So he's done all these things. He's governor of North Carolina in 1865 when Raleigh falls to the forces of Sherman. He sends his wife and boys west to get away from the war. And finally, he takes a train out of Greensboro, heading west, riding in a, in a boxcar with about 200 other people. He manages to get to Statesville and settles there, which uh, Raleigh falls in early April. He's in Statesville with his family in a little rented house in May. So three weeks later, it's his birthday. They took with them, when he took his wife and boys west, they took some of the furniture from the governor's mansion in North Carolina with them so that it wouldn't be looted by the soldiers who came in. So when they were living in a little rented house in Statesville, they had some of the governor's mansion's furniture and their own furniture in that little house. On his birthday in mid-May, Union troops came in, arrested him, took everything in the house. They put him on a train and sent him to Capitol Prison in Washington. The furniture has not been seen since. So if you're going to get any yard sales in Pennsylvania, <laughs> please call the governor of North Carolina if you find anything that looks like it belongs to them. Jeff Vance was put in Capitol Prison along with most of the high ranking Confederate officials. Remember, Lincoln had been assassinated in April of 1865, and at that point, the federal government freaked, thinking there might be a Civil War Part II now. So they just rounded up all the high ranking officials and put them in jail in Washington. Jeff Vance roomed with Governor Lester of Virginia. They collected the whole set. Well, about three months later, so July of 1865, the hysteria had died down, and they let them all go home. But they had passed a law in those three months, and that law said that if you had been a high-ranking Confederate official, you could not run for office until they felt like you could. So it would be years. Well, that was in a hard place then. That's all he knew. He'd been a congressman, senator, governor, colonel of the 26th. He had gone to law school when he was 21 years old, but he hadn't practiced law in 10 years. But he had the wife and boys to support, and you can't be a politician until further notice. 
So he falls back on doing the only job he knows how to do, and that's being a lawyer. So he set up a little law office in Charlotte with Clement Dowd, another attorney, and he's hoping to get some clients that'll pay him enough money to support his wife and kids. And he had started that law practice in December of 1865, so three or four months after he got back from the prison. In September of 1866, so about nine months later, a judge in Wilkes County, North Carolina, Wilkesboro, summoned him and told him that he was, he was going to defend two murder defendants. Tom Dula and Ann Milton, and he's going to do it for free. You know that if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. Well, that, that's a pretty long-standing tradition. Only in the 19th century, pro bono, you will work for free, actually meant it. These days, they give lawyers some little minimum to, to represent indigent clients. In the 19th century, free meant free. So here was that man who really needed money, having to defend two defendants who could never afford to pay him. But he did a good job. He, he at least got two trials for the young man. And I think the problem was, A, that he's not a very good lawyer. He's sort of like Andy Griffith. That man's won a lot of cases. That's the only capital case he ever took, and he didn't take it voluntarily. But he was the kind of lawyer that liked to get up and tell jokes and be funny and be charming so that the jury would like him. And they'd go in the jury room and go, oh, let's acquit that client of this. We heard his feelings that we found against him. <laughs> and that works really well if you're dealing with tax problems or land disputes or deeds or wills. But when you are trying a case in which a 22-year-old unmarried girl is dead. You can't counteract the sentiment about her death with funny stories. So he was over his head as a lawyer. But he's back in his book because he wants the lawyer to defend him, Tom Dula. You notice I'm saying Dula. If you've heard the Kingston Trio song, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> Starting with his name. It was more syncopated for a folk singer's purposes to call him Dooley, but his name was actually Dula, D-U-L-A. He was not hanged in a lonesome valley from a white oak tree. He was hanged by the railroad depot in Statesville from that crossroad <laughs> that I told you about. So the song is, is very fanciful. And I'm far enough from North Carolina now that there are probably a lot of you who don't know the story. A lot of you don't remember 1958 either, so, so much for the fun song. <laughs> Tom Dillon was born in 1843 on a little farm in the Piedmont. Wilkes County looks about like this. The high mountains are 50 miles away, so they've got those same low ridges around that you have right here. So his farm would have had the same scenery that you would get here, ridges in the distance. Not high, but, but walls, of, walls of, of mountains that are low, long ridges. He was the third and youngest son of the Dewas. He had two older brothers, John and Lenny. His father died when he was a young boy, and so his widowed mother ran the farm, kept the farm, and raised those boys by herself. And Tom, well, his early life, he was, he lived 15 miles from the nearest town. He's grown up on a farm. I think he can read and write a little bit. I know he can, to a certain extent. There's not a lot to do. My name's fishing. And the one thing Tom Dillon has never been accused of is working hard. No one ever said he did that. However, and, and I go back to court testimony, there's a trial transcript about this case. So I went to Raleigh and bought it and read it. Because this case has passed into folklore. We have a lot of, Amer of American ballads that are really English ballads. The Knoxville girl was once the Wexford girl. 
the banks of the Ohio goes back to an English song. Little Margaret is Lady Margaret. So almost all the songs that we learned as, as ballads were brought over from Britain. Tom Dooley is an American original. If the story happened here and the song was created here, it had a catchy tune, and so it became very popular. And because of that, people fought off the story, I think, kind of to go with it. Frankie Silver also has a ballad, but it's long, dull, and the tune is very hard to remember. So if you're ever charged with murder in North Carolina, after you get a lawyer, get a songwriter, <laughs> because otherwise you're going to be forgotten. <laughs> to unearth the Frankie Silver ballad out of the Library of Congress on real to real tape. But Tom Dooley you can get anywhere, in any language, just about. So they have made this case into a folk tale. And we do that, I think, with, with stories. Stories um, are the way that we try to make a pattern out of the chaos of life. And you can see people doing this all the time. Anytime something happens, you look for the pattern. When Kate Middleton married Prince William back in April, you could hardly find a single news story that didn't use the word Cinderella. The poor girl marries the prince. That was people trying to put a template onto a set of facts. What pattern does this fit? And maybe it didn't fit that pattern. People have tried to do that with the Tom Dilla story, and the pattern that they're trying to fit it to is something like Romeo and Juliet. So I better go back and say some of the story before I tell you how, how they, they messed it up. Trial testimony, not making any of this up, you can't make this stuff up. When Tom was 13 years old and Ann Melton was 14, they lived, and always did live, a mile apart. He's on this road, she lives on the road that it runs into. Anne was a very beautiful girl, and she'd be the first to tell you that. Her mother, Lottie Foster, um, had five children. No one ever thought to marry her, and she had a reputation for hard drinking. You may wonder how she supported herself, and if you would like to call Jerry Springer, he'll probably give you some suggestions. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm pretty sure that Anne was the one who ended up taking care of those four younger brothers and sisters. When she was 14 and Tom was 13, her mother caught them in bed together. She ran Tom off with a broom, but that establishes their relationship as going back to earliest adolescence. She was beautiful, and they were attractive. Now, the first tale that they tell in Wilkes County, which is one raccoon short of a Disney movie, <laughs> says, that, <laughs> says that Tom went away to the Civil War and that Anne married another. Well, I respect that, but it's doubt that gives you an education. So what I did was to go to Wilkes Community College and talk to librarians, historians, genealogists, and the people that had the records from the 19th century. And we all got together. We made a little team like criminal minds. We would all meet and exchange emails and get and pull our information. And so I got the librarian to look up the marriage records of Anne Foster, which was her original name. And she got married, sure enough, at the age of 15, to James Melton, in June, in June of 1859. Now, the Civil War started in 1861, so nobody had left for the war in 1859. She married James not because Tom had gone anywhere, because he hadn't, but because she wanted to get out of the house. Here she is living with a dirt poor mother, having to take care of these kids. James lives across the street and up the hill, and He's got a house, a little bit of land, some livestock, he's a wagon maker, and he makes shoes. So he's not exactly a prince, but compared to the, to the socioeconomic status she had growing up, he is definitely an improvement. So she